I was the first guy in the water. I swam up to the capsule, attached a sea anchor, which was a, a parachute about 12 feet in diameter, swam up the capsule. Neil Armstrong gave me a thumbs up that they were okay inside. Uh, my teammates followed me in the water. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. My father and his three brothers all served in World War II. My two brothers, one was drafted, in, both were drafted into the Army. One went to uh, Panama, one went to Germany. I enlisted in the Navy and I went to Vietnam twice. Well, uh, boot camp was exciting. <clears throat> uh, during boot camp, uh, they, they offered a screen test for those that wanted to go into underwater demolition or seals. And uh, a fellow uh, in my platoon and I went and I passed. But uh, Christmas leave, I got a telegram that said uh, report to UDT training. I uh, was a member of the class 44. They said about 2,000 people on uh, Navy wide would take a screen test to start a class. Ours started with 79. And uh, after going through Hell Week, we had 29 left. So uh, the, the hardest part of training was just persevering. Uh, the cold water was the killer. A lot of us came out of high school. We did four sports maybe, uh, and so we were pretty much in shape. But it wasn't the muscles. It was uh, if you could dis, uh, uh, disassociate the pain and put it in a compartment and just go on. But it was the cold water that got everybody, I think. Uh, it was The hell week was the hardest. We went, uh, I think it was six nights, uh, five days and a half without any sleep. And uh, that's what uh, really separated some of the men from the boys, I guess. Once we went through our basic training, at that period, 1968, when I graduated, they allowed us to choose. And I chose uh, underwater demolition teams. Half of my class chose SEALs. And so and then you go into different types of training. If you stay in the Navy, you go back and forth. And then eventually it was just SEAL team. The UDT evolved from uh, World War II. They needed someone to clear the beaches, uh, demolition work, that uh, they, they would uh, go in and monitor the depths of all of the ocean there where the boats would come in to see if there was enough depth for them to land. Uh, if there was things to be blown up, they would call into UDT. And that evolved into the 1960s when we went to Vietnam. Uh, we did a lot of demolition work. We rode the river boats with the riverine people and when they come across a dam that needed to be uh, moved, we would uh, provide the demolition. When boats were sunk and uh, they had to retrieve the guns or bodies, we were called on to dive down and retrieve the bodies or the, the guns that were lost. And uh, we had, there's a lot of fish takes in Vietnam. Uh, with the, there's just a myriad of rivers in Vietnam where the boats would go down. And uh, if it wasn't wide enough for some of the boats, we'd go in and pr provide the demolition to deepen the waters or widen the stream or whatever. Uh, we were on call and uh, we had specialty one orders. Uh, we could go to an airport and show our orders to get on a plane, go anywhere. And if they needed us, they would send us around Vietnam to do certain jobs. We manned the guns on the river boats. Uh, sometimes we went on patrols with the Viet High or the Kit Carson Scouts. Uh, so in various jobs. Twice I was in Vietnam uh, on land. Uh, we stayed at mobile facilities. Uh, second tour was a place called Sea Float. Admiral Zumalt uh, had that built. There was like 14 barges put together with uh, wooden shacks on top and the river reinforces worked out of there. The SEAL team worked out of there. The underwater demolition people worked out of there and you would patrol all these little rivers. And uh, that was basically what we did. And we had a base on Da Nang. We, we flew in there once in a while and worked with them. Our tours were six months. Uh, we had uh, underwater demolition team 11, 12, and 13 when I was in. And one team would be Westpac for six months. Two teams would be back going to training in the schools. Then we'd just rotate around. I was in the Navy long enough to make two of those Westpac tours. Um, the fire fret that I was on, the SEAL team had been down this deep Mekong Delta. 
they they worked a lot with the CIA and thinks they had high intelligence and their their missions were a little bit different than ours, but they had uh, intelligence that uh, showed a village down where, where we were in the Mekong Delta. There was probably more Viet Cong down there than. Uh, the normal people because it was controlled. All the little villages everywhere, little hamlets. And so they, one village had a, a sign across the, the small stream that just said, stay out. Uh, the Viet Cong would, you know, come into the village and the villagers didn't know who to support. One day they were with us, the next day they were with somebody else. And so we had the intelligence and so they took two boats and we decided just to go down there, go through that wire and see what happened, I guess. And we went through the first wire, nothing happened. 50 yards later was a second wire, and we could tell something was gonna happen because the villagers were running, and usually when uh, they are waving, everything's okay, but when they start hiding, you know something's gonna happen. And when we broke through that second wire, our boat was ambushed uh, with the Viet Cong. They had B-40 rockets on both sides of the stream, and our boat was hit with like eight of them. I was wounded in a firefight. Uh, we called in the helicopters, and of course they come in and direct their rockets, and then it's over. Uh, those firefights only lasted about 10 minutes, and the Viet Cong went down in their bunkers or whatever. And so we led off our troops, it was the Viet High uh, Vietnamese troops, and our boat had to be towed in because it was damaged. I received a leg wound, and uh, that uh, took me through most of my tour because I was recovering, you know. I had a year left to do the Navy. The Navy is very kind. Because when I received that uh, leg wound, they promoted me up one rank. Uh, I should have got wounded twice. I got, got better pay, I guess, but uh, I had a year to do when I went back. When I was in Vietnam, I had lost three high school friends by the time I was in my second tour. Uh, Larry Smith, Gary Smith, and Terry Beck. Uh, they were my age, and uh, we had, came from a small town. And after the Apollo 11 uh, recovery that it was on, uh, it was the 60s, you have to remember. Uh, we were invaded by those British singing groups, the Beatles, the Bears, the Monkeys, the Turtles, the Animals, and uh, there was a lot of, uh, you know, hippie movement and drugs and things. and. Unfortunately, some of my teammates introduced me to some of those drugs, and so when I was over in Vietnam the second time, um, I took a, a pill, it was LSD, and I started to hallucinate. The walls begin to melt, and the cockroaches look like monsters, and I heard these hideous voices reminding me of my friends who had just been killed, and uh, they were also, you know, telling me what a louse I was, and you know, why don't you just end things now? I stepped out on the balcony and the curfew was taking place. You could hear the sounds of gunfire going off in the distance and you could see flashes uh, of parachute flares back in the distance. And I walked back in the room and the voices continued. And I said, you know, why don't you just take your life? I went to the bed, I pulled out my nine metal pistol and I had it in my hand. And I heard a little voice that I heard one time before when I was just a little boy in Wisconsin, uh, where that voice said, John, I love you and I got a plan for your life. And I just assumed that was God. So I put the gun down. And that was the beginning of a relationship that blossomed and blossomed. You mentioned when I got back to the United States, I continued in that lifestyle somewhat, but it just didn't fit and I was, feeling condemned and finally I got tired of living like that. And I saw a little advertisement in a reminder paper when I was in uh, Coronado. It talked about a, a revival of this church in uh, Imperial Beach, California. And so I decided to go and I went and uh, it was a Pentecostal church. So I repented that night. God filled me with the spirit. I was baptized in Jesus' name. and. It was such a life transforming experience that I went back to my unit and I started sharing it with everybody. At first they would run in every direction, but I could run as fast as they could. And pretty soon some of the guys said, hey, we might as well just go and get it over with. So I had a Ford van, I filled it up with my buddies and took them to that little church. And the same thing that happened to me began to happen to my buddies. And out of that revival, there was uh, five of us, five uh, UDT guys that ended up in the ministry.
I went back a few years later, about 12 years later, I was in the area ministering, and I took one of the pastors there in uh, Chula Vista to the compound, and I was walking through the training unit, and somebody got the uh, commanding officer of the unit, and uh, he asked me what my name was, and I handed him a book I had, and he looked at it, and he said, you're the guy. He said, they still talk about that. And I said, really? So I said, why? He said, we got to change so many lives. So it was kind of like folklore for a few years. But one of the fellows that I brought to the Lord is pastoring that church in Imperial Beach where we got saved. One was a missionary to uh, China, Taiwan. One was an evangelist. And uh, I did missionary work myself. I've been going back to Vietnam since uh, 1992 uh, doing mission work. And uh, I built a Memorial Bible College in central Vietnam in honor of my five SEAL teammates that were killed, uh, Jim Gore, John Durlin, Richard Solano, uh, Toby Thomas, and uh, John Donnelly, and then my three high school friends. So we dedicated it to them as a memorial, and uh, we, we have a good group of people there. The first time I went back, I landed in Hanoi. And of course, you know, that was the seat of the enemy. I didn't know what to expect. Uh, the first night there, we, my wife was with me. We booked into a hotel. I just went out in the streets and started walking. And of course, I looked a lot different than the Vietnamese. So as I was walking around the hotel in the streets, uh, a crowd started to gather. One man came out of the crowd. I think he'd been drinking, but he grabbed me and he had me in this lock. And uh, I couldn't speak Vietnamese and he couldn't speak English. And I really didn't know what was going on. But then it dawned on me, he would say, hey man, the war is over. I've moved on, how about you? And that's when I, f I felt the Lord was calling me. He said, John, you're gonna come back. You're not gonna be carrying an M16 this time. You're gonna be carrying uh, the Bible. And it took a few years. We were doing mission work in the Philippines. And uh, I heard about a refugee camp in Bataan and the refugee people were coming from Vietnam and Laos and uh, Cambodia in these little rickety boats. And so I went out there to visit and uh, it just hit me so hard. I knew that someday when the, with Vietnam would open, I'd be going back. So I did make that first trip in 1992. I probably made 60 to 80 trips since then. And uh, one of the highlights, is I baptized this old man who said he was a general in the VC Army. So uh, if that's true, that's uh, quite a, story to tell, I guess. When uh, I was in Vietnam the first time around, I had an officer, uh, Wes Chesser, and uh, when we came back stateside, they were looking for volunteers to be involved with the Apollo 10 and 11, and Wes uh, volunteered. And so I was uh, invited to be along. We had contests to see who would do what. I was a pretty fast swimmer, and with fins, I could really move pretty fast. They needed somebody to catch the capsule. So on Apollo 11, uh, I was chosen to be the sea anchor man. And uh, we were out on the USS Hornet the night before. Uh, we were to, uh, oh, the astronauts were to crash in the ocean. They changed the location 250 miles because of storms. So the ship was uh, racing to get to the scene. There were three groups that could actually rescue the astronauts. And we were designated to be the primary team, but whoever was the closest to the capsule would get in the water. Unfortunately, the capsule landed in the Pacific, not by us, but another group. But the capsule turned upside down, and uh, Buzz Aldrin had to flip some switches to inflate these uh, balloons. It took about five minutes to upright the capsule. Meanwhile, our helicopter was racing to the scene, and we got there just in time for the capsule to upright, and they told the other group to move out of the way, and our helicopter uh, came in, and I was the first guy in the water. I swam up to the capsule, attached a sea anchor, which was a, a parachute about 12 feet in diameter, swam up the capsule. Neil Armstrong gave me a thumbs up that they were okay inside. Uh, my teammates followed me in the water, uh, Mike Mallory, Wes Chesser, Clancy Heidelberg, and uh, we attached a raft in front of the capsule after we put the collar around, 
and then there was one wrapped up win where we would sit when the hatch door was open. The first moonshot, no one knew uh, what was, you know, if there's any contaminants, um, lunar pathogens. So there was a washing procedure. Clancy Hellberg had on a biological isolation garment. He had three of them for the astronauts. They put them on, they came out into the raft, and they had to all be scrubbed down. And so it, mm, 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 mm. <laughs> they couldn't really talk, a lot of hand signals. Uh, we were on, we had to be on open circuit ourselves until the astronauts were lifted into helicopters. Then we took off the tanks and our face mask and all of that. But until that decontamination was complete, uh, we couldn't really communicate except smiles and through their, you know, that mask they had on, that biological isolation garment. Our raft came in close to lifeguard and uh, the helicopter came back and we were there to assist them to enter into the helicopter, which flew back to the USS Hornet. President uh, Nixon was there, uh, Kissinger and some of the other fellows that greet him. And we stayed out in the uh, ocean with the capsule until the ship came aside. And if you've never seen anything like that, the ship's th like three football fields long, 20 stories high, and you look like uh, a city block coming at you and you're just a little thimble out there in the ocean. The coxswain was pretty good. He came right next to the capsule. I'm standing on top. Uh, I, w I had these flowers on my wetsuit. On Apollo 10, uh, we put a flower on the window of the capsule, and NASA wasn't real happy about that, so they told us no tomfoolery on this one. And we had the decals, and I was the lowest uh, ranking fellow. I was 20 years old, so I put them on my vest and on my wetsuit. But uh, I'm on top, top of the capsule, and you can see those flowers in the pictures, and it seems like uh, people always gravitate towards that picture for some reason. You know, uh, it's amazing what, uh, you know, I have friends who never left my hometown. I mean, some are doctors, lawyers, they're good people, but they just never had the experience. And a journey of a thousand miles always begins with that one step. And uh, the recruiter said, join the Navy, you get to see the world. Uh, I believed him. And uh, I got to see a little bit of it, but I had no idea that in four years I would make two tours to Vietnam and be a part of Apollo 10 and 11. And to be a part of history is just amazing. Uh, you know, half a billion people watched the, the first walk on the moon. And uh, it was the biggest talk in the world leading up to that. And then to come from a small town, uh, I think joining the Navy for all those adventures, you know. Uh, that morning we woke up, there was so much excitement on the inside, knowing that you're gonna be a part of history. And then to be the first guy in the whole world to swim up, look in the astronaut's window and say, hey guys, congratulations, that was a th thrill, you know. Uh, it's a tight network of people when you go through things, the people that we served with in Vietnam, uh, there's a kindred spirit there that uh, you don't have unless you've been there. Uh, some of my friends, the greatest thing that they saw during those four years was the county fair. And I come home and, you know, I've seen war, I've been wounded, I've been in the hospitals looking at people that uh, are wounded on, alongside me. You, you lose friends. There's just a lot of life uh, that happens before you're 21 years old that you can't replace. And those foundational things stay with you the, the, your whole life.